So first up, we've got Sarah Bird. Called the finest living Texas writer by Texas Observer Magazine, Sarah Bird is a best-selling novelist, screenwriter, essayist, and journalist. She has published 11 novels and three books of essays. Sarah's been an NPR Moth Radio Hour storyteller, a nine-time winner of Austin's Best Fiction Award, a finalist for the Dublin International Literary Award, an Alex Award winner, Amazon Literature Best of the Year selection, a Barnes & Noble's Discover Great Writers selection, a New York Public Library's Books to Remember, an honoree of the Texas Writers Hall of Fame, and Adobe Bicentennial Fellow. She has written for O Magazine, The New York Times, Chicago Tribune, Texas Observer, Texas Highways, Slate, and Salon, among, among others, and was the backstage, back, back page columnist for Texas Monthly for six years. A 10-year career as a screenwriter when she wrote for such companies as Warner Brothers and Paramount led to her selection for the Meryl Streep Screenwriters Lab. Sarah co-founded the Writers League of Texas, is the 2021 winner of the University of New Mexico's Paul Ray Award for Cultural Advocacy, and is the hologram breeder at Austin Central Library. She is currently working on a book of the photos she took in the late 70s at Black Rodeos to be published by UT Press in June 2024 under the title Juneteenth Rodeo, Let's Go, Let's Show, Let's Rodeo. Welcome, Sarah. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. <laughs> I know you're wondering, and yet she's only what, 39, 20? <laughs> How could she have done all that? Ooh la la. All right, next up, David Wright Falde is the author of three books, The Narrative History, Fire on the Beach, Recovering the Lost Story of Richard Etheridge and the Pea Island Lifesavers, and the novels Away Running and most recently Black Cloud Rising. The New Yorker chose Fire on the Beach as one of its notable selections, and the St. Louis pa Post-Dispatch named it one of its best books of 2001. Away Running was named an Outstanding International Book by the U.S. Board of On Books for Young People and was selected by the Junior Library Guild and the Texas Library Association for its high school reading list. An excerpt from Black Cloud Rising entitled The Sandbanks 1861 appeared in The New Yorker. A former Fulbright Fellow to Brazil, David Wright Valaday is the 2021 to 22 Mary Ellen von der Hayden Fellow of the New York Public Library's Coleman Center for Writers. His work has been recognized by the Zora Neale Hurston and Richard Wright Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Texas Institute of Letters. He teaches in the MFA program at the University of Illinois. Welcome, David. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Sam. All right, so let's get started. I we're really going to spend a lot of time digging into your most recent books. We're going to get really specific about your writing process and your research processes. Um, but I want to start a little more broadly. And I think it's important for writers to um, definitely tap into the why of writing. And so that's where I want to begin. Why are you drawn to writing about the past? Where does that impulse come from for you, no matter what historical story you're trying to tell? So Sarah, I'll start with you. Um, you know, that's a great question. It's, it, it's a really, really good question. And um, I think for me, certainly my last, I would say my last two books, um, uh, Last Dance in the Starlight Pier and uh, this one, D Daughter of a Daughter of a Queen, they kind of arose out of a sense of obligation. These were books I felt I had to write, you know, before I pass on this veil. Um, uh, this uh, Daughter of a Daughter is the, uh, it's inspired by the true story of the only woman to have ever served with the Buffalo Soldiers. And I first heard this story. You mentioned the, the book I'm doing, uh, the photos I took at Black Rodeos. I first heard this story. I first heard about Kathy Williams in 1978. And, you know, so I waited 40, 50 years. Before I was certain somebody would tell this story. And then, you know, I hit a point that, uh, you know, much, much closer to the end than to the beginning. And I realized I, you know, nobody had told Kathy's story. And so, so that was what, you know, that's, you know, really my first purely historical fiction novel. I, I've done historical parts in some of my other novels, but that, so that I would say is a sense of obligation and a little bit for uh, my most recent novel, Last Dance on the Starlight Pier. And that was based on uh, my mother's story about growing up in the Great Depression. And she told wonderful stories about 
the dance marathons, which, you know, sounded like these jolly events kind of a cross between a, a church supper and a sleepover. And so that was my impression that I had of the dance marathons. And that was in, you know, vivid contrast to the ne my next encounter, which was uh, with the movie that came out in 1969, They Shoot Horses, Don't They?, which was just unrelievedly grim. So I just felt I, you know, and I also wanted to capture some of my mom's experiences of uh, in nurses training. So I think I think those things tug at a lot of people who write historical fiction. I, um, you know, I've read a bit about David and, and you know, in your work, and I think I think you have an element of that in your work as well. Yeah, like I I think that. Um... I think it's a it's a wonderful question, and I, I find it a hard one too because it, like I've always been, um, I've always been fascinated, intrigued by history, sort of how it works, how we got to where we are, and so like I'm seeing it in that way, this sort of you know uh, this complex interwoven thing, but that's leading to where we are now. But why I, you know, I could just read it or you know study it or something. I found myself gravitating towards it as a writer a little bit by happenstance. When I first started writing, um, you know, it was very much uh, coming from a, more of an autobiographical place. Mm -hmm. um, the impulse that I had to write was trying to, I think a lot about sort of race and class, uh, race, class, and gender, um, Americanness broadly. Um, and in thinking about that, that was, those were the themes I wanted to try to write about. But as I was writing about them as related to me and my experience, it never felt, I don't know, I just have a little bit of a block, not a block like I can't write it, I would write it, but I just didn't feel, I felt more comfortable approaching it with history as this sort of um, um, uh, organizing principle. Um, yeah. And I didn't even realize I was doing that until the, the, the piece that came out in the New Yorker, um, the excerpt from the novel that came out in the New Yorker, they do this little interview afterwards. And in the interview, the editor um, made that association between, <laughs> between me and Richard Etheridge. And until that point, I was just like, no, I'm writing about Richard uh -huh. Etheridge. But I also was like, Great. you know, of course, this is what I'm writing about. And so I feel like the history gives me a chance to address the questions that are personal yeah. to me and that um, are the, the reason that I write but they give me a sort of scaffolding that I think is better than just sort of going, you know, I grew up in Borger, Texas or whatever that is. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, may I just piggyback on that? Because I kind of, you know, see it in, in this, the same evolution from, from, you know, mostly autobiographical concerns. And I, I, you know, I feel like in my younger years, the big mess, big mystery was what, what's going to be next? What's going to be next? You know, and, uh, and then I reach a point, I reach a point in my life, and I think it's the same point in which, you know, people start becoming interested in genealogy and whatnot. But then the big question was, what came before? You know, how did we get here? How did I get here? How did our country get here? How did those kind of questions? And, and you know, so that started. The fascination kind of shifted from my own personal life to, what you know, there possibly could be much more interesting lives out there than mine. And so I, you know, kind of wanted more to uh, dive into those. Yeah, you know, to live another life, another another era. Yeah, yeah, completely, very much so. And it, I find that, I don't know if this has been your experience too, it's not that the eras aren't so different, but people are people. Um, and so it's interesting it's clarifying, I, I should say, maybe illuminating to understand sort of complex humanity in a completely different social context, historical context. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. You know, on, on that point, I have a question for you, and which, mm -hmm. is, which is one that I've run into, which is how to make today's readers with the sensibilities and the progress we've made in the evolution in our thinking, understand some, you know, kind of fairly despicable things that were commonplace. Say for example, you know, in my books a uh, hundred years ago, 200 years ago. And um, it's been interesting to me and I've gotten some moral judgments about, 
you know, I wouldn't do that. I said, well, you know, thank God, you, you, you know, we've come a long way, but I think that's part of, that's part of the job is to help people, you know, just get themselves into a different frame of mind to understand the limitations that, you know, you, you can't be smarter or, are wiser or kinder than the time you're born into, unless you're a very, very unusual person. Right. I, I definitely want to come back to that question, um, but I do want to backtrack just a little bit to give the audience um, some time to get to know these latest books that you had and just like what is the beginning of that writing process for you. So if you could tell us a little bit about your most recent book. So for you, Sarah, would be The Last Dance on the Starlight Pier and for you, David, Black Cloud Rising. And if you could tell us just what inspired these specific stories. And I'm particularly curious, like what comes first for you? Does the research inform your story ideas or do your story ideas lead you to research when it comes to fiction? And David, I'll come back to you. Okay. Oh, you're, so you want me to start? Um, yeah, I don't know that I intentionally, so two things. Uh, and let me apologize ahead of, ahead of time. I, I speak a little circuitously sometimes, I think it's just my head works that way for better and worse. Um, but two, two things, like on, on the one hand, I, would, I only realized that I was writing historical fiction with Black Cloud Rising when some of the reviews started started calling it historical fiction. Um, and that ah. sounds really stupid in some ways because it's, I, I, I always knew it was a book set in the Civil War and that slavery was really central to what's going on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But for me, it was a story about family. You know, one of the questions that, that was troubling and it's, it's a, a, a question that dates back to my first book, which was nonfiction, um, Fire on the Beach, about the main character of Black Cloud Rising. So you'd asked, I think, that we described the, the, the book, the current book a little bit, and I skipped over that part. The current book is uh, set during the Civil War, three weeks during the Civil War, an all-Black unit uh, of Union soldiers of recently freed fleet slaves who escaped the plantations um, in Tidewater, Virginia, um, at the moment where they're debating whether or not to arm Black soldiers, uh, a radical, ab in all senses of the word, abolitionist general who is their commander leads them on a foray back into the region where they had been slaves to confront the Confederate guerrillas there and then also to free all the slaves in the region who are their family and friends. So it's the story of that three week foray and it's from the history. Um, and I stumbled upon the story during my first book which was a, a, a narrative history of the main character. But part of the thing that drew me to writing this novel wasn't that three week foray that I found fascinating when I stumbled upon it 25 years ago. There was very little written about it then historically, very little research that had been done, but it was completely fascinating. But um, the more central question for me was some of the things that I couldn't firmly answer in the first book, the nonfiction book, which is called Fire on the Beach, which is to say the main character whose name's Richard Etheridge was very likely his master's son, his, his former owner's son. I couldn't prove it. So in the nonfiction book, I could, in a couple of paragraphs, describe the things that lead me to believe that, um, but I couldn't do more with it. Um, and so it always felt like a whole, and that was the piece of it that interested me. Fire on the Beach tells the story of like, it's like the early Coast Guard, so there's shipwrecks and all this stuff like that, which are fascinating and interesting and dramatic. But what was most dramatic was, what does that look like? When your master is your father, when you're in a small community like that, what's the relationship between the slave owner and your mother who is a slave? That piece of it that I couldn't properly explore as nonfiction always intrigued me. And so when I started writing Black Cloud Rising after this terrible, terrible failure with this other novel that just completely tanked. Oh um, boy. Terrible, terrible. So I was asking myself, am I actually capable of doing this, of being a, a novelist, of being a writer? And I remembered that story from Fire on the Beach, the first book, but it was the family piece. I thought I was writing about this father's complicated father-son relationship and this Cain and Abel relationship between a, you know the civil the, the the classic civil war story is brother against brother. Well, what if one of the brothers is white and one of the brothers is black? And that's what I thought I was writing. And then it turns out it's an historical novel. Um, so <laughs> yeah, 
that was that circuitous answer. I'm not sure I actually answered your question. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And I think the fact that it started with this hole that you couldn't answer in your nonfiction book is really fascinating. Yeah. And I'm curious, when it comes to nonfiction writing, um, do you also start with questions that you're trying to answer? Or was it more just like, I'm really interested in this topic and I'm going to do research on it and write a book about it? With Fire on the Beach, it was complete happenstance. Um, on the cover of the of the book, uh, Fire on the Beach, is this picture of the this all black Coast Guard crew. And when I I actually didn't stumble upon it, it was presented to. It was my first year of graduate school in Virginia when I, I'd lived abroad for like five years um, after college, and I was back in the United States. I thought just through graduate school, and I was gonna. I thought myself expatriate, and I'm gonna go live, you know, back to my life. But in that first year, I co-wrote it with um, a, a friend who was a poet, a first year poet in the MFA program. And I was a first year fiction writer and it was fall term. And we were, you know, like all first year graduate students, just sort of discontented with the world and our lot and our bad TA stipends and everything. And we were at a, 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 a party towards the end of the fall semester and very sort of stereotypically, predictably, somebody pulled out a guitar and is playing the guitar kind of okay. But it just, we were just those guys. So we were sitting in the kitchen and Zobi asked me if I'd ever heard of the P Island Lifesavers. And at that point, I had never heard of P Island of the Outer Banks. Um, but when he started asking me these questions and uh, he referred to this picture that's on the cover, Zobi had grown up in that part of the world. And if you have ever been to the Outer Banks, like the lore of the lifesaving service is just alive still today. It was so prominent. Um, the lifesaving service was the forerunner of the Coast Guard. And there were in the 19th century, there were late 19th century, there were 200 stations. And then there was this one that was run and staffed by black people. So to me, I was just completely interested, but we thought we were doing something for grad school, something that might become a grad school project, but, but it was just happenstance. I don't know, a long way to way of saying, I'm imagining that I was gonna write nonfiction, much, much less a history, but the story ended up not being written about and being so rich. So it was just good luck, yeah. Thank you. Sarah, tell us about The Last Dance on the Starlight Pier and what inspired it and where you begin when it comes to historical fiction. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, so this, this is a book about the world of the dance marathons set during the Great Depression. And it started with my mom's story. So she was a fabulous, fabulous storyteller, you know, kind of kept her six sassy children enthralled and somehow even managed to make the Great Depression sound like an awful lot of fun, in spite of the fact that her father had died at the height of the Great Depression. He was a farmer on in a very struggling Indiana farm and left behind um, three children, four children and a wife. And, you know, it was a very, very difficult time. But my mom, as, she, as I mentioned, she would tell these stories about, you know, the winter they survived on nothing but eggs and make it sound like just a cracking good adventure <laughs> and but she did tell about the time that you know, just stood out in her memory when a dance marathon was held at the Grange Hall there in, in their little community and how what a thrilling event it was and how you know very inexpensive entertainment all the kids in, in that community could get together and bring a lunch and stay however long they want for a nickel and then get crushes on the boys from out of town and cheer on the local favorites. So that in my mind was, you know, kind of an example of how Americans had come together and survived the Great Depression. And, and then, as I mentioned, Kaboom, 1969, uh, the movie comes out, they shoot horses, don't they? The Jane Fonda movie with somebody else. But, um, you know, and so that always kind of nagged at me. It's like there's, you know, this disjunction between Hollywood's version of what the dance marathons were and my mother's, you know, frolicking kind of re remembrance. So, uh, you know, I, I put it aside and didn't really think that much about it until I, you know, just started doing a little bit of research. And the first thing I found was the novel that They Shoot Horses is based upon was written by this guy who had been a bouncer at, uh, at some of these shows on the Santa Monica Pier. And then he became a failed screenwriter, Horace McCoy. 
And Horace McCoy had very consciously set out to write the first American existential novel. And, you know, and so <laughs> it's just not going to be a jolly affair, you know, Camus and Sartre and those, you know, laugh a minute bunch. Uh, so that was, you know, just questioning why we're here and, you know, the waste of human existence and whatnot. The other thing I quickly found out uh, about the Hollywood portrayal of the dance marathons of the Great Depression was that they had left out the Great Depression. And it's just impossible to understand this phenomenon without that context, without understanding how truly, truly dire the times were. This was the worst depression, not only in America's history, but in the history of the industrial world. And over one quarter of working force was out of business. 40% of those who were still employed had their salaries slashed. And it was, it was just an extreme time. So I knew I wanted to tell that story because it's it's just kind of shocking to me that something that was that popular and at their at the peak of their popularity, there were something like uh, every town over 50,000 people had a dance marathon. They employed 20,000 people around the country. Hmm. And, you know, to give some kind of context, the uh, World Wrestling Enterprise currently around the world only employs a thousand people. So they, you know, they have promoters and nurses and, and what were called sloppers, people that kept everybody fed. So it's just, and I just fell in love with the anthropology of this strange world and the whole way that their language and their ethos, their rules, and how essentially it was the basis of reality television. They would create love interests and rivals and enemies and who to root for and who to boo for. So this, it just really gripped me. And then I had this great, great moment in research. I don't know, you probably had them, David, where you just like, you just want to jump up and down. You can't believe what you found. I found this great photograph and uh, it's actually, I, I love it so much. I put it in the, the back of the book. Um, I don't know if you can see this. Is this, is this visible at all? Can you see this anyway? Okay, this is an entirely packed out city auditorium and the accompanying newspaper article said it was capacity crowd of 2000 in spite of the heavy rains. And the wonderful, wonderful thing about this that just accelerated me so much was it took place in Galveston, Texas. Mm -hmm. Galveston, Texas in the thirties was the most glamorous spot on earth. You would not believe it by going to Galveston now, <laughs> but it was, it was because of these two immigrant brothers from Sicily, the Maceo brothers, uh, who I modeled some of my characters after, they essentially invented, invented Las Vegas. And so to find out that an actual show had taken place there and they had, it was the center of uh, medical education in Texas at that time. And I, I wanted my character to be a, a nursing student like my mother had been. It was, it, it just all fell together so beautifully. And I had tremendous fun researching. Yeah, I mean, that's a perfect segue into my next question because when it comes to historical fiction, like writers are gonna need to do research. And I'm curious what that research process looks like for you, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. Um, do you look at newspapers and the archives? Do you conduct interviews? Like what is that process? Um, look like when you're writing a historical book? And Sarah, I'll stick with you. <laughs> I was just thinking, it's like all of the above. <laughs> um, but I'm sure you found this too. It's just essential to, to saturate yourself in first person stuff, you know, of the period, uh, diaries, letters, uh, memoirs. Um, and, you know, before you, well, you can, you know, Actually, I'll, I'll go through step by step. Um, I first, I start, I have started in the past in various subjects with kids' books because you'll get a terrific overview and it's kind of the foundational stuff that has to be in there. And then a general, a general history of the period. And then, you know, you just get more and more and more specific and drill down and down and down. But um, for my last two novels, I mean, the thing that kind of two things really electrify me and that's photographs and and the language 
that was particularly true for um, Daughter of a Daughter, which is set uh, as your novel during, it starts during the Civil War and then continues through, um, you know, when, when uh, my heroine goes out West. But I, I, I knew from the beginning that if I could not create a voice for her that was, that we hopefully had not heard before, that I wasn't gonna do it. And so, but my God, you know, researching 19th century language, and I'm sure you found this, David, it's just such a gift. I mean, the expressions, and it was wonderful, you know, like, um, I made a little lexicon. I go through, you know, every time I found something good, you know, something I hadn't heard, something that was fresh. And I, I would make, you know, a lexicon. And so I got, you know, pages and pages of stuff. And so there were things like uh, if somebody was worthless, I'd say, you know, carry guts to a bear. And somebody is really worthless, all vine and no taters. Uh, talking to a mule, you go back, 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 back. Uh, can't wait for something to happen. You're crying for daylight. Um, and I love this one saying wild as an acre of snakes, but those that really informed my character and her voice. And I wanted it. I didn't want her to be Southern. I didn't, I, I really wanted her to be more Western than Southern. And so that was very important. It was different when, as far as the language, um, when I was doing the book during the thirties, and this, I think, is something that, you know, writers, you need to be aware of, that something may be accurate, but it's not going to sound accurate. And, or, it, you know, it sticks out. And there's a lot of language from the 30s that, um, uh, a lot of language from, um, you know, kind of contemporary words that you're shocked that, you know, they've been there so long. But in the 30s is sort of problematic, 30s and 20s, because then there's a lot of language like, you know, the bee's knees and 23 skidoo and, and or, you know, 30s gangster language, cheese it, it's the cops and, and that kind of talk. So I, um, I really kind of pulled back from that. And it, it's, she's, my character is more contemporary, but um, the research really starts for me with, you know, just, you just got to you just got to read everything you can about it and, and books of the period and, you know, wait, wait till your characters start talking to you. And then as many historical <laughs> fiction novels advise, throw it all away. What about you, David? <laughs> How do you approach it? <laughs> I mean, really similarly, really similarly, I, I had with Black Cloud Rising, I had the, um, I had the benefit of all the research that I'd done for Fire on the Beach. And though Fire on the Beach is, you know, 1842 to 1900, and much more focused on the post-war period, I had a strong sense of who I thought those characters were, um, those people. Well, I shouldn't speak of them in character because it was writing as nonfiction. I had a strong sense of who the people were, but from the research. And um, I also, this, this might not sound like a, um, a benefit, um, but it was a benefit. When, we, when Zoe and I first started Fire on the Beach, we were first told that there was just nothing. It had, we were told that it had not been written about. Um, someone in the chat had mentioned Alex H Haley as his black Coast Guardsman. Alex H Haley had taken an interest in writing about the, the crew, but again, believing that there wasn't a whole lot of uh, documents that had survived, um, got interested in other things. Thank goodness for us. Um, and thank goodness for me, and it left me a book to write. But um, what Zoe and I found out is that in fact, there was all this documentation and it made me fall in love with research actually, but not in a way that I think is necessarily useful for writers because you can also just spend all your time with the research. When we found out that there were documents and there are, I mean, some of the people I hold up as heroes are librarians and archivists. They are so knowledgeable <laughs> yeah. and so enthusiastic. So once you yes. start to look, they help you know how to look better. And then they right. bring you these old documents and you get, you know, the letters and the, we didn't find a lot of letters regrettably, but we found a lot of official documentation by these people. Um, and so you're hand, so you're not just um, reading the information, you're handling physical objects that also have a certain, not just gravitas, but help you understand the period. But just echoing what Sarah said, the more close and personal, the better. At a certain point, we were reading the, uh, the the local paper, Zobie and I were, 
it was so rich. You know, you want to understand 1890, read the local paper from 1890, every issue at a certain point, you know, you're a little bit lost, you get a little bit bored, but there's so much that even just the advertisements the give you, yes. you know, just gives you this right. minutia of detail. And so, so much of that could not fit in too far on the beach. And all of that helped me with Black Cloud Rising, then the more recent novel, you know, render the specific. And one more thing before again, because I'm a little bit all over the place as usual. Sarah, you mentioned voice. I, this doesn't happen to me, um, but I think part of it is a byproduct, again, of the research from Fire on the Beach. So on the one hand, reading these voices in more formal versions, sometimes actually very sort of military version, because these were, you know, uh, life-saving service and Coast Guard stock, Coast Guard later would become the Coast Guard documents and things like that. Um, but when we first started the research, doing the research and we're believing that there were no documents, um, this was in 1993. Um, and several elderly people in the Outer Banks who had been related to the men we were researching were still alive. So, you know, folks who had been born in 1907 and 1915. And if you've ever been to the Outer Banks, it's very particular. Bridges were built in the 1930s, but before these bridges were built that connects the Outer Banks to the mainland, if you're an outer banker, you were as likely to have contact with somebody sailing by who might be coming from Brazil than you were with people from inland. It was that isolated. Um, and so consequently, the way that they speak has a Southern um, um, lilt to it, but a lot of the expressions are closer to sort of old England and this mix of things because of the black presence. Um, and so the language was super specific. And so when Black Cloud Rising, when I was thinking, oh, I remember this story about this three week excursion and that's a way to explore Richard Etheridge and his familial relationships, I heard the voice. And that's the thing that doesn't happen to me. And what I realized just really recently, it's, pre it's those older people's voices and in particular one man um, who was born in 1915 and we interviewed him a lot. And he just had such a characteristic way of speaking. Um, nice. It just, so, Again, this never happens, but the first five or six pages of Black Cloud Rising are basically like I'm a rewriter, but those first five or six pages are basically what I, the first five or six pages I wrote, not too terribly altered because I heard the voice. So the question wasn't, yeah. could I tell the story? There was a dramatic story. The question was, could I sustain the voice for 300 pages? You know, because it was such an interesting voice to me, but so distinct. That's fascinating. That's yeah, I definitely want to dive into a lot of what the both of you just said. Um, but for this next question, I think something that historical fiction writers really have to grapple with is finding that balance between the research and the facts and the fictional story that you're trying to tell. And I loved what you said, Sarah, about doing all this research because it's going to help you and then you throw it all away. So can you talk about how you find that balance? Um it's it's a fine line, you know, and I will say, you know, I in in retrospect, I probably erred a little, you know, on occasion falling in love with my research, which we, you know, you just have to commit to the story. But uh, I, I, you know, I would almost recommend this as a method because it it kind of uh, it kind of helped me avoid that problem with daughter of a daughter in that, so this is the story of a black woman and I didn't feel that I had the right to tell that story. I didn't, you know, to, to, because, you know, I was hearing her voice in first person and, and, you know, I just, I just didn't feel I should write that as a novel. And so I wrote it as a screenplay because, you know, as a screenplay, then the story does not belong to me. It belongs to the actors who portray the characters and, and the director. Um, but that, you know, it's sadly it, it never got made, but um, inadvertently, it's a great way to write a historical novel because it really forces you to just tell the story. And which was very, you know, another thing that intimidated me wildly was to go into an arena where, and I don't know if David feels the same way, but when you're writing historical fiction, you just have, you know, the little buff the buffs in your head, you know, like the history buffs, they're going to attack you if you get, if you get this gun cartridge wrong or, you know, any, uh, 
And so I was really scared of buffs in general, but particularly in that era, because there's an, a Civil War buff on every corner. It's, it's a, a, people know a lot about the Civil War, and they know a lot about the, the settling of the West. And so, you know, when I wrote it as a screenplay, I was not responsible for, you know, deciding what kind of gun Kathy picked up. You know, that was the prop person's problem. It's just like, she picked up a gun, you know? <laughs> She's armed, you take care. So, so that, so I have this, you know, like skeleton. I have the story, but none of the, I mean, some of the historical detail. Um, but so, you know, then going back, you know, I just had to backfill in all that detail and, you know, and really to find her voice kind of more than anything. Um, so, you know, inadvertently, that's not a bad way to write a historical novel. The um, uh, Last Dance on the Starlight Pier, that, um, you know, I kind of, I, I, that was a historical commitment in a sense to me because I wanted to say something about America at that period. Uh, and I wanted people obviously to compare it to America at this time. Uh, and so I pivoted the story around the nomination of FDR in 1932 at the Chicago National Convention. And it just, I mean, to read FDR's speeches at that time will just give you goosebumps. They're mm. so relevant. You know, he talks mm. about wealth inequality as, and, and the rise of authoritarianism throughout Europe and, and the dangers America was facing and how, you know, the industrialist is not being bothered by this depression and the big guy, you know, it's the small guy. So, so that, uh, that was really the impetus there. And, and, and another, you know, little something historical novelists will find very useful to do a timeline. You know, in my case, it was very specifically, um, to to FDR and his administration, although he doesn't appear very much, but um, you know, so, you know things that were actually happening in real life, and then you know, then make your other timeline of how what your characters are doing that time, and how old they are, and how old their mother is, and how old their sisters are, and whatnot. So, um, so that kind of those kind of things sort of helped me wade through the research, and then I I knew what I was looking for. I knew how to tell the story. I'm currently working on one right now that's um, sort of kicking my ass pretty bad, but I may have cracked it. I may have cracked it with the help of our wondrous Amy Gentry. If you're out there, Amy, thank you. She's helping me figure it out. <laughs> how <are> you, Dave? <laughs> I see in the chat that Amy Gentry is there. Yeah. Oh, Amy! <laughs> so. She's, she's going to help me write it. Um, yeah, I, I would echo everything that, that Sarah said and just maybe underscore one thing. Um, like the research, this stuff happens in our heads. Everybody's not writers or not or whatever, but you know, you sort of, we intake information in the way that we intake information and you know, what we're retaining, holding on to, um, is sometimes a lot more than we're actually aware of. So doing that, all that research and just sort of getting it in there and taking lots of notes and doing this and that and whatever um, is hugely important as a pre-writing sort of thing. But the actual piece of writing, uh, slightly digressive. I remember when I was first beginning to write I was reading a lot of um, interviews with writers, trying to figure out process and this and that, whatever. You know, I'd never taken a creative writing course or anything like that. And I remember reading James Waldron, and he described himself as a rewriter, and that made sense to me and also resonated with me. And I'm saying that as a way to say, once it's time to actually write the story, you know, the the what you said, Sarah, was you know, you commit to the story, and it's that. It's not this sort of you know. Yeah, it's, it's at the end of the day, a, a historical novel is a novel. And so it has to work as a novel. Um, it's not a vehicle for the history. Um, it can be a scaffolding, like I said earlier, but it's not a vehicle. The, the story is the story. And so, you know, to, you know, 
cite the Faulkner cliche, you've got to just murder a bunch of darlings to make sure that you're telling the best story that you can tell. And a lot of those darlings with, with historical fiction are some of the really great, wonderful pieces of history <laughs> that are so colorful, but they just don't help you tell the story. Yeah. Thank you. When it came to your nonfiction writing, David, um, how did you kind of build a narrative from the research? Because it's there's also a story there, but it's not a fictional novel where you have to make it a little bit more dramatic in that sense. So how did you how did that go for you? It was it was really hard. And it was I mean, again, I, I don't mean to say that in such a way like, oh, and look at me, aren't I great? It was really hard because it's hard. But also it was my first book and I wasn't intending to write you know, again, we stumbled on, Zobie and I stumbled on this. But one of the things I think that I understood that we both understood very early on, um, when we first started writing, in part because I, you know, I'd taken one history class before stumbling upon the Pea Island story. I took a history class in, um, in college, Japanese civilization. I had notions about American history, but I needed to learn not just the history, but also how to be an historian. And consequently, a first, it wasn't a first draft. I mean, it was a very polished draft, but a first version was very much modeled like a monograph um, because that's what I was reading. I was reading these academic books, these academic histories. um, And it actually landed with a university press. But the story was so interesting and big and dramatic. And we had a a few smaller successes that were, you know, had broader appeal. People would always go, that should be a movie or that should be, you know. And uh, a mentor of mine, was friends with um, a woman who died just, Valerie Boyd, just this past fall, who wrote this uh, important biography of Zora Neale Hurston. And he's like, I can introduce you to her agent. And it was just a little bit of luck like that. Um, Met the agent, the agent was like, yeah, this is a great story. I think I could sell it, but I could not sell that book. And so Zobie and I had to understand how to write it more narratively. So we'd done all the research. We had notions of pieces. And we just had to figure out then how to tell it narratively. So it circled then back to the MFA training. How do you tell a compelling narrative? Character, plot as you can find it. Um, a sense of place in the Outer Banks are so unique. So we relied upon the tools that we'd learned um, as fi- me as a fiction writer, fictionalizing nothing, but looking for the fictional sorts of details or those elements. Um, and it was, again, I'm, I'm stating the obvious, but it's hard with non with nonfiction because you're bound to the nonfiction in a way that you're not, say, with a novel. So, mm. thank you. All um, right. I hope yeah. I answered your question. I was a little circuitous there. Yes. <laughs> no, that was great. Thank you. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how you actually bring the past to life on the page because we're talking about research and we're talking about all of this history. Um, but at the heart of your books are these characters. And I, so I want to talk about character building. And I'm wondering, how do you build characters that are authentic and believable and that feel like they're from the time that you're writing about? And I think we can talk about this in terms of like dialogue dialogue and the speech that they use or the clothing that they're way, they wear or the way that they think about certain things and the ideas that they have. Um, but how did you approach character building in your historical fiction novels? And Sarah, I will come back to you. All right, then. Um, but I, uh, you know, probably because I lived with the story so long of the, of the uh, woman who became a Buffalo soldier. And I read so deeply in that period, um, I, I could hear her voice. I mean, I, I just heard her voice. And um, I think David, in one of your interviews, you mentioned the problem of, of writing black history from that time and how little documentation there is because of uh, you know, various injustices, like it was illegal to teach the enslaved people to read, to write. And so they could not write their own memoirs. So, uh, you know, there's very little documentation and it seemed, you know, it's kind of incumbent upon the author to create that voice uh, as much as possible. Um, then my, uh, one of the key things in creating the character for Last Dance on the Starlight Pier was, I had known a lot of, I have a lot of friends or several friends who's, um, you know, they, they had mothers who were not capable of giving them unconditional love. Mm-hmm. And 
that's just, if you know someone who hasn't gotten that, there's always this hole inside of them. And, you know, they're always becoming who you want them to become or, you know, very charming people, a lot them become actors a lot or um, people that just know, know how to, you know, read your dreams and give them back to you. So I, I was fascinated by that kind of a character and wanted to create, and, and then I, I read this uh, memoir of, of an actress whose mother had, was probably the most infamous stage mother of all time. And the Broadway play Gypsy was based on her. Her, her sister was Gypsy Rose Lee, and this actress was writing about uh, growing up with, with a mother who put her on stage, on the vaudeville stage, practically the time that she could just learning to walk and put her in toe shoes. And so she was marketed as the pint-sized Pavlova. And that fascinated me as the core of someone's character, that they're always trying to please and, and make things right for everybody else. And that that's, you know, eventually she be, she becomes a nurse and that's, that's really exactly who she should be. Um, but it is, as I mentioned earlier, I get a lot from, from dialogue and how they would speak and, and what their attitude is. And um, yeah, I, I don't know, it's just, it's, it's like, you know, you, you, you meet somebody in your imagination and they kind of tell you what they would or would not do. And, and once you establish who they are, it's like having this big gigantic equation that if this character would do this thing, what would this character do now? And having spent 10 years writing, doing work in Hollywood and writing TV movies and whatnot. And also I started off in genre fiction. So it's kind of useful to know what the expected thing would be to do. And, so I'm always asking myself, what would the character really do? What would really happen? What would really happen in real life? And, and uh, so those are kind of things that help me build characters. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my response is uh, um, um, a variation of, of the same thing. I remember, again, reading those interviews with, with writers I would, you know, you'd, that had been published in the Paris Review or whatever. But I remember James Baldwin describing um, how once he really knew his characters, their actions would play out for play out for themselves in his mind like he was watching a play. And so it becomes, for me, that's it. Um, I am drawn to the thing that 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 draws me to write or uh, to writing is is character. And it's the complexity of character, like not white hat, black hat, a villain is this. It's it's that people are these sort of nuanced, layered, complex. We're, we're just all really complex individuals. Even so in my own work, I sort of want to understand as many of the characters as possible in this complex way. And when I feel like I, I'm ready to write, they and I and that's usually when I fully understand the character, it sort of again it there it plays itself out in my mind. It sounds a little schizophrenic, maybe, but it plays itself out in my mind like a movie or a play. And yeah, it's less me determining that I want this to happen or I need this to happen. It's basically understanding the characters, having some sense of the you know of, of certain plot points where we need to go. So it's not devoid of plot, but they're basically going to get me there if I've fully understood them well enough, if that makes sense. Yeah. It does, yeah. thank you. So I wanna bring this conversation full circle now, and I wanna talk about the question you posed earlier today, Sarah, about how you sort of make all of this meaningful and relevant to readers today. Um, and some things are going to be more difficult to get across to readers than others. And so I'm wondering how you both kind of accomplish this and how you think about taking these historical facts and characters and details and kind of making them mean something to readers in the now. And I'll stick with you, David. That was really important to me. And I wasn't it was always there. It was always present as something that I was thinking about. 
but I didn't want to, I certainly didn't want to do it with a heavy hand. And the way that I want, the way that I thought I might be able to avoid doing it with a heavy hand is sort of, for me anyway, in my understanding of, of Americanness, because at heart, I'm asking this question for myself, at least about Americanness. And so if that's the underlying question, that's as relevant in 1619 as it is in 1776, as it is in 1863 when the novel set, as it is in 23, when I'm, or as it turns out, 2016 or whatever, when I'm sitting down to write it. Um, and, and so I was aware of that, but I, I ended up very specifically doing this thing um, that early editor, an early editor was like, you should maybe cut that. But the afterward to Black Cloud Rising um, skips forward. So the novel is basically three weeks, but then the, the afterward, it's an epilogue, but I, I call it an afterward, is actually turns, uh, uh, occurs at the turn of the century, 1899. And Richard Etheridge, the main character, is, is sitting and sort of reflecting on this three-week excursion. Um, and in so doing then, it's like which sometimes when you see in movies, like at the end of Animal House, where it's like John Belushi became a senator or whatever. <laughs> it's, it's not exactly that. But it's kind of serving that role. I wanted to sort of catch up sort of what happened, but not in that Animal House sort of way, more as a way to sort of go. Because what's happening literally in 1899, uh, as Richard Etheridge, the actual person, is sitting in a station in Pea Island, you know, the year before, 150 miles down the beach in Wilmington was Wilmington Racial Massacre. Um, Jim Crow is being established literally in law. You know, the local newspaper that I read all the editions of I, from it uh, in the novel, it's a literal quote from the, the paper. And they're uh, a white supremacist paper, not white supremacist in this sort of abstract, like we can tend to use the word today. And I don't mean to diminish that we shouldn't be using it that way. I'm just saying that then it was literally the political platform of the, of the Democratic Party. So there were these resonances and so to have Richard Etheridge sitting there in 1899, reflecting on that moment in his youth, whatever it would be, 35 years before, when he had fought not just for his freedom, because those men weren't men and women, weren't just fighting former slaves to be free. They were asserting their right to full citizenship. That would happen in a more staggered way later. But in their minds, it's not just we are free, we are fully American. Right? We are not the stereotypes you're reading in plantation traditional literature. We are not this and that, whatever. We are fully American. And so Richard Etheridge in 1899, Wilmington having just happened, him basically being referred to as an Uncle Tom in the newspaper, inadvertently, it was meant to be a compliment. He's thinking on back, back on what he had done to arrive at this place. It probably feels a little bit, little bit bittersweet. And that seemed to me to reflect the cycle of history that might suggest that we can maybe look at where we are today too, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I um, that originally was sort of one of the central questions of my last novel. Um, you know, I and I specifically articulated at the beginning of the book in which my main character is chastising herself for decisions she made and asking how can someone be smarter, wiser, kinder, bigger, better than the time they're born into? And in this specific case, it's, um, it has to do with a, a medical procedure in the 30s, which was advised for homosexuality. Homosexuality was criminalized at that point. And so this medical procedure was an advance over that way of thinking. And you know, it's a horrific procedure I'm not gonna go into. But, um, you know, I really, I really attempted to lay the groundwork for why this character thought she was doing the best thing for this man she loved and how it would be the solution, how everything in her medical training told her it would be the solution. And I think, you know, by and large, I succeeded. But I was also really surprised that I got letters from people saying I was surprised mm. that she would do this. How could she how? So there, there is the challenge of, of, you know, trying to erase all the knowledge that readers have in their head. And, you know, like you go back to this time, it, it was a different time and we didn't know what we didn't know. So that, um, you know, it, that it is one of those things, you know, she's, uh, and there were, there were a lot of uh, very, you know, befuddled people that were, you know, good people, they just didn't know at that point. 
So that, you know, that's an example of, of you know, really trying to make the, the, the way people think at that time come alive and, and understandable to a modern reader. And it can be a challenge when, you know, when readers are looking kind of for things to, things to object to. All right. Well, thank you both so much. We're going to move into the Q&A now. So for our audience, if you have any lingering questions for our panelists, please add them to the Q&A box and we will get to as many as we can. So to kick us off, we have a question from Carol. Um, do you have tips on when to stop researching and start writing? It's tempting to try to learn everything about the time period, which isn't possible. David? I, as a this is true of any piece of writing, historical fiction, just fiction, history, whatever. The thing that is most daunting to me is, is the blank page. I just, again, I, I think of myself as a rewriter in part because I feel much more comfortable when I have a bunch of words on the page. So at a, at a certain point, it's really comfortable to just keep researching more, but you just got to. So you've just got to figure out when that point is the important thing isn't that what you put down is good or even necessarily right, but that you get words down. Because once you have words down, you can start circling back. And I pirated this from Hemingway in A Movable Feast, um, which is probably more fiction than nonfiction, but it's a really good read. But at one point he's talking about, um, you know, writing his first book in the 20s and how every day he would start by re-reading what he'd written before. And I do that. The hardest part is getting the words down. But if you stop doing the research, or if you not even stop doing the research, you're continuing to do the research even, but you start putting the words on the page and then circling back, that looping process, it all moves forward sort of organically. That for me works. I think we all, in fact, I know, we all approach writing so differently. But for me, at a certain point, you just got to start getting words on the page, even if they aren't good words or the right words or the right scene. Thank you. Sarah, anything to add? I kind of like to uh, fool myself a little bit in that I will, I will, you know, if I if I read something and I and so what I like to do, I'm kind of a method writer in that I I become my character and then I go out to the world and and shop for things that she would like or you know <laughs> see how she would react to things, and so when I'm doing the research and I come across some little gem or something and I know how my character would react, I, I write that. And so I have, you know, it's, it's your little tent pole somewhere, something that you stake, stake in there. But um, when I, I also get to the point, you know, that you mentioned, David, where it's much more comfortable to be researching and it's fun and it feels like work, but then there's some point you just have this feeling, this isn't really work anymore. You're wasting time. And then, at that point, I will just start writing. And if there comes, you know, I need to look up something, I just, you know, say, fill in the blank and keep writing. Just like you will, you'll fill that in later that, you know, don't, don't stop the momentum for, for some historical detail and, you know, power on. Awesome. Thank you. Next question. How do you know when you're going down a rabbit hole versus getting something interesting or golden? <laughs> Sarah? <laughs> uh, I've been down many a rabbit hole. <laughs> and I've actually, you know, as I say, in retrospect, I think I've occasionally deformed some of my books by, by you know, like in, including the rabbit hole. This is such a juicy rabbit hole. We've got to put it in the book and it doesn't belong there. Uh, and then, you know, then I rip it out later. Uh, how do you know you're going down? Uh, you know, I'm not sh I, it's a yes and no thing because if I find it fascinating, probably somebody else is going to find it fascinating too. And if it is a rabbit hole, it's generally a rabbit hole that hasn't been explored a lot. And that's good too, you know, to put some new stuff out there. So the answer is I'm not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> with, with me, um... I'm, I'm approaching this like a process question. And this is something that I, I, I don't even remember when I started doing it, but I, I've been doing it for quite a while. Again, with this sort of um, um, abject fear of the blank page, and then this sort of circling back, this beginning of the rewriting process early, 
at a certain point, and there are usually pressures that are that are getting me to 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 realize I need to do it. But I stop myself and I make an outline of what I have. So not an outline of where I want to go or where I think I need to go, but taking the words on the page and outlining them um, so that I have in sort of bullet points the entire thing that I've done. And in that way, you know, I can see, you know, this piece just is redundant with this piece. I may really like it, but which one serves the purpose more? I, I, you know, or, you know, this piece maybe could be melded with that piece, or this piece might fit here, or this piece can be cut. And that sort of, um, um, like I, I also associate it with a sort of discipline, but I feel like if I don't um, assert that sort of discipline of myself, then I may not finish. Uh, Cause I'm really afraid of the rabbit holes. I'm really afraid of just sort of following my intuition or whatever. So, the, so you need to, you need to give yourself permission to sort of go, but then I also need these mechanisms to sort of feel like I'm also shaping it and directing it. So that's one of the things I do. Awesome, thank you. All right, next question. What tools, softwares, for example, do you use during the process of writing historical fiction? David? None? Almost, uh, <laughs> literally almost, I mean, Google and things like that, uh, you know, Wikipedia pages uh, to remind me of things and things like that, but but not a ton. I mean, I Microsoft Word and there you go. I love the sources. And I used, to, I, you know, I used to have physical ones, but anymore, there's such great ones online and etymology. So those, I guess those are the main tools, online thesauruses and online etymologies. Um, yeah, because they're so in choosing the, 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 or in figuring out the right word that's going to evoke the thing that you're trying to evoke, etymologies in particular, on, online etymologies are pretty awesome, I have to say. And chat rooms about etymology, also pretty awesome. <laughs> Awesome, thank uh, you. My favorite tool is my husband because he uh, he's an engineer and he makes spreadsheets for me. So I tell him like when my character was born. So then when how old would she be here when this is happening? You know, and all this all this amorphous conglomerate of facts. You know, he like and then I have a spreadsheet and I can look. So you know, here's my tip: marry an engineer. <laughs> Thank you. I'll add, I've heard Scrivener is very good for helping with organizing and stuff like that. It you is. Know, I'm tempted to use that and it just buffaloed me. Maybe I don't, <laughs> I, you know, I've heard, I've heard a lot of people like it a great deal too, to keep your uh, research organized. Yeah. I've heard there is a learning curve though. So there's that to keep in mind, but <laughs> could be the right software for somebody. Um, all right. So next question, how far back is historical? Uh, you know, what is that recent uh, series on television, Daisy Jones and the Six? Mm -hmm. That's based on what is called a historical novel. It's set in the 70s. Set? Does that sound I, right to you, David? To me, it sounds right. But I'm, I'm going to, again, I'm going to go back to one of my early answers. I didn't realize I was writing historical fiction when I was writing about the Civil War. I did think that I was writing historical fiction when I wrote my young adult novel that's set in 2005 during the Paris riots, because the Paris riots were central to what I was writing about. And it was a decade, it was only a decade later, but it felt like, it felt, yeah, historical in that regard. So I don't know. I, I mean, that's a long winded way of saying I don't know, but I, to, yeah, I think if, if somebody wanted to have an argument about it, I would argue that A Way Running is an historical novel, even though it's only set in 2005. But you know, uh, let me add this to just really briefly. And again, sort of echoing that first answer, which is to say, I thought I was writing about family when I wrote Black Cloud Rising and knowing full well that I was writing about the Civil War, but people are gonna call things what they need to call them or what they even want to call them or whatever. And I'm okay with that. I find it instructive, but I'm not trying to determine that too terribly much ahead of time. I mostly want to write the story that I think is important to write for me, that I hope will have a resonance for others, and then they can call it what they want. But the important thing is that they're reading it, I think. You know what I mean? Yes. Thank you. 
All right, next question. Some historical stories come more easily than others. Any tips for what to do with the ones that get onto the page, bloated with facts and reading forms? Are there ways to work with what's there or do you need to throw it away and start again? <laughs> There's somebody dealing with a bloated novel. <laughs> uh, come forward here. Uh, well, you know, as David says, it's all in the rewrite. You've got something down on the page that you can, you know, massage into shape, you know, get after it, hack and slash and uh, bloat it. I, yeah, uh, historical novels can bloat very quickly because, because they involve so much world building. You know, you can't, you have to explain somebody's just not going to get into a car and everybody understands about what happens when you get into a car you know it might be you know you might have to crank the the sh crankshaft you know you might be getting on a horse but there's there's so you know just a lot of words in creating the past a believable inhabitable past so uh, uh my condolences for the bloat i i understand i i would i i agree a thousand percent and i i add, I think it's a good problem to have. Again, make an outline of what you got. And an outline, the fact of making it is going to force you to recognize, you know, if you're going to sort of reduce a scene into a phrase or two phrases, it's going to force you to sort of acknowledge the essence of the thing that that thing is, that that scene is supposed to be doing. And then when you have it laid out in front of you, at least I can see it so much more clearly then. Again, this repeats this. This isn't doing any particularly useful work. And, you know, whatever it is, this is exactly what I was trying to do. But then at least I can see it so much more clearly than that it helps me get through the bloat and get me back on track. But the bloat is a good, it's a good problem to have. It means that you're, I would think, it means that you're fully in it and you've got, you know, the world is all there in your head. So it's, it's, it's a technical problem at that point. It's a writerly problem about how do you make it, the word that, that Sarah used, that you use, Sarah, you massage it into shape then. Uh, I, would, I would add like two things that, you know, kind of help me in rewriting is to, um, you know, like I'll send, I'll send something to myself on my phone and, or just put it in a different typeface or something so it looks different and, and things will jump out at you, you know, once you, be, you know, you become inured to the typeface that you use or have are used to seeing it on your computer and, and, you know, the tedious parts will become, and you know, you really want to find the tedious parts, read it out loud, read it out loud or try to get somebody to, to let you read it out loud to them. And man, the point at which they fall asleep, you can start cutting, you can just yeah. hack that right out. That's a great suggestion. Your, hear, your ear hears so much. Um, I did this more regularly when there were still cassettes, but I take a lot of long drives. Uh, I mean, not just sort of randomly, like I'll drive to Illinois, I'll drive. But I, I, the, my first couple of novels, um, I read them into a tape recorder. So the oh, act of reading it was wow. an exercise. But then as I was driving this long distance, I listened to myself reading it. And both of those two pieces of that exercise were so useful, so useful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I've never done it with a really long piece. I you know I do it with articles and you know make my husband listen to them. But boy, you know the uh, padding just jumps out at you. Completely, you, your ear hears things that your eye has stopped seeing. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Thank you. Uh, next question: How do you write in dialect? That's a great question. It's a really fraught one, I think. I totally jumped in. I'm sorry, Sarah. I didn't mean- I No, didn't no, 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 no. I was just, uh, you know. It's, so I, I teach also, and I teach uh, uh, race and representation, race class, gender and representation. This class I just left. We were looking at uh, race and representation uh, from Twain to Hurston, basically. And um, so there's a, there's, there is a politics to it, and I don't mean in the in the sense that you should uh, submit to the politics, but I do think you want to be aware of it. Um, Sarah, you were talking earlier about not feeling like you had the right to 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 write that black woman's story as a novel, 
And I admire and respect that very much. At the same time, this feels like it's digressive from the dialect question, but I, I think it's going to fold back in. But I feel like if who we are, and I'm making assumptions about everybody in, in this, in this uh, space, who we are is Americans. And part of what we are um, inquiring in our writing is Americanness. then I feel like it needs to be dialogic on some level. One of the things I noted uh, in, a, in, in teaching fiction workshops to undergrads, my students of color always write, color, always write uh, 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 characters of other races, characters who are not just them. My white students rarely do because of the politics of it. And so I'm saying all that as a way to say that I feel like if we are going to move forward, I'm speaking in an ideal sort of way because I do believe that cultural appropriation exists, but I feel like if we're going to move forward in a certain way, we have to give ourselves permission to, that's what a writer does, is imagines bigger than merely oneself. And so with dialect, the, the difficulty, I was going to say problem, but that's not the best word. The difficulty with dialect is that it's got this particular history. So you're not just merely representing what you are imagining on the page, it also has resonances with how those representations have been put forward. And I think you wanna be aware of that, which is not a way to say avoid doing it, but be overly aware of what you're doing so that you control it as much as possible, if possible. Does that kind of make sense? I love that. I love that. Hail to you, David Wright. Um, let me ask you a question. So I'm currently, um, I'm currently writing the narrative for the uh, Black Rodeo photo book. And I, you know, I went to a lot of, of Black Rodeos, Juneteenth Rodeos, and there's just this incredibly beautiful, rich language that's not, not just specifically Black, but it's country, you know, and it's a country element that's, it's, I don't know. Anyway, I attempted to capture it and I'm getting a lot of pushback from that mm. because, uh, you know, because it's an academic press and, and various things like that. But so I don't know, in, in your way of looking at things, how would I convey that kind of, the, you know, that country, you know, it's really soft on the ear and, and, and beautiful and, and, uh, very vibrant, very interactive, uh, you know, I, some, anyway, that's my current dilemma. So thank you for uh, mentioning dialect. Yeah, I, I, sounds like some of which, sounds like some of the pushback you're encountering is specifically political and political in the way that I think is not necessarily healthy, which doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And again, doesn't mean that the problem of appropriation doesn't exist. But if the press is just pushing back because they're afraid of getting that pushback themselves. That's a political problem that I, I, I'm sorry that you're encountering. Okay. With that said, what I found useful in trying to render, say, Black English, Black vernacular English on the page, and I grew up with varieties of Black English, like we all did, varieties of English. But there were two, well, one book and one author that were hugely helpful. Toni Morrison, her first books especially, the first five, renders Black English in all its dignity without, you never forget that you're reading Black vernacular English, but it, on the page, it looks, it, it looks like literature. But there's also this book from, uh, it's an anthropology book from 19, I think it's 1980 called, I'll, I was gonna type it into chat, but I don't know if I can do that. It's called Dry Long So, one word, Dry Long So, one word. And it was this, I think Philadelphia anthropologist who just went back to, he was a, a, a black man, just went back to his old neighborhood and was captivated by language and just recorded the way that people spoke and avoided, so he, he put the, the dialect on the page, but avoided the phonetic spelling and all that. And the beauty, the lyricism of the language just jumps off the page. Even as you go, that's not grammatical English or what does that expression mean or whatever, it completely jumps off the page. I go back to dry long so all the time when I feel like, Excellent. oh, I Thank can't you. quite pin down the language. Yeah. Thank you. Good tip. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a really good book. I think you'll like it. Awesome. Thank you both. Okay. Um, next question. Do you front load the context and historical detail early in your stories to ground the setting and then make detail more sparse as the story goes along? Or do you feel you need to always remind the reader of the flavor of your setting in time? 
I would say A. Hmm. You know, build, <laughs> build the world and, you know, then don't remind them particularly that they're in it, except occasionally. You know, once, like during the Great Depression, you know, you establish hunger. Actually, that's kind of a continuing motif throughout my book. Um, yeah, I, you know, as, as little as you can get away with is, is the right amount. Yeah, the, the, I would say as little as little as possible is the right amount. And at the same time, I, I feel like, and this is maybe, this is not a very good tip because it's not a tip at all. I feel like those moments also let you know, like this is a moment to, to, to sort of take a few more words or a few more sentences or maybe even a paragraph to emphasize place or to emphasize this. Um, I feel like those moments alert you to them. And then in rewriting you, we were talking about bloat, the, the bloat presents itself too when you've overdone it. Um, so I, I guess that's a long-winded way of saying, I don't think I think about it that much, except for I'm keenly aware of it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that is about all the time we have for tonight, but thank you for your insights. It was great hearing you talk about your processes and all of that good stuff. Um, for our audience, definitely buy these wonderful books. Um, there are a lot of links in the chat that you can check out. We have tons going on with Writers League of Texas programming. I do want to say we missed our third panelist tonight, Kate Winkler Dawson. She had a family emergency, but if you are a narrative nonfiction writer, absolutely check her work out. It is incredible. She is brilliant. She also has a podcast that you can listen to, um, but thank you all so much. Thank you to everyone who joined us and have a great thank night. Thank you all. Thank you, thank Sarah. You. Thank you, Sam. Thank you all so much. Thank it was you, really David. fun. Sam, great discussion. I enjoyed yeah. it. Wonderful questions. Yeah, great, great. <laughs> We're both wonderful. <laughs> All right, y'all. I am now going to have dinner uh, <laughs> after the classes. So thank you all so much. Ciao. Bye, Writers League. Happy I co-founded you. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.